Hello and welcome everyone to this second webinar of the Internews Earth Journalism Network's country themed uh, webinar series. The Earth Journalism Network seeks to support environmental journalists to do investigations and some of you um, recently applied for the latest grant opportunity. So welcome again. In this uh, first webinar, we share tips and tools for invest for journalists who are interested in investigating environmental crime and wildlife trafficking. Uh, that was the first webinar and it was meant for journalists in Kenya. Uh, today in this second webinar, we are looking at um, uh, sharing with environmental journalists in Uganda, uh, tips and tools that will enable you to do your own investigations uh, during this COVID-19 era. I'm delighted to be your moderator today my name is Benon Herbert Oluka. I'm the Earth Journalism Network's investigative editor for East Africa. The title for this session, as you might have already got uh, a hint from what I shared earlier, is investigating environmental and uh, investigating wildlife and environmental crime in the COVID-19 era. We are sharing on tips and tools specifically for Ugandan journalists. In this session, we bring together four experts in journalism and uh, issues of the environment to share their insights on the possible resources that you as a journalist can use to do your investigations. During this second webinar, the experts will discuss the latest trends in environmental and wildlife crime in Uganda. Uh, they will talk about areas for potential investigations, uh, the available online tools for investigations on em wildlife trafficking and environmental degradation, local resources, uh, that you can use to enhance your stories and areas for possible collaborations with counterparts around East Africa. So again, I welcome you to this session. Uh, just to let you know, we are recording this session and it will be available on the Earth Journalism Network's website. Uh, take a look at that uh, in a few weeks. You can share them with friends. Now, let me introduce um, some of our speakers. I'm delighted that we've been joined by today by four leading four leading experts in uh, issues journalism and environment, and they will be speaking uh, about this uh, shortly. First, we have the executive director of the Internews Art Journalism Network, that's James Fan. James will be with us for the first one hour of the session, and then he will have to leave because he has another engagement. So if you have any questions for James, please uh, send them to us as soon as possible. And we will be asking him when he's done with his presentation. The second speaker is Didi Wamkoya, who is a senior manager for wildlife law enforcement uh, and species protection at the African Wildlife Foundation. Uh, she'll speak second. Our third speaker is Esther Nakazi, who is a freelance science journalist. She's a blogger, and she's also a trainer for internews uh, for journalists in South Sudan. Finally, we will have Frederick Mujira, who is the founder of the Water Journalists, uh, Water journalists Africa and a, a co-founder of InfoNile. So as you can see, we have a really uh, strong team of people who are going to speak to us. Now, after they have spoken, we'll ask questions. So we'd like to hear from you in the audience. We welcome questions. Please share them throughout the session through the uh, question and answer uh, box in, in your, that you can see at the bottom. Now, we'll start with James, who will share with us his opening remarks. Uh, James, as I said, is the executive director of the Earth Journalism Network. Uh, James, you're welcome. Thank you, Benon, and hi, everyone. Very nice to be here with you. Thank you all for joining us, and it's uh, great to be a part of this panel here. Uh, I, it's, uh, you know, I, I did manage to travel to Uganda, I believe, 10 years ago, um, and uh, very much enjoyed my time there. So hope to get there again someday. Right now, I'm in California. It's very early here, uh, but it's great to be with you all virtually. So. Uh, yeah, and uh, really appreciate your interest in investigative reporting on wildlife issues and environmental issues. And uh, 
I'm sorry, I can only be here for the first hour, uh, but we really do encourage questions. So if you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to ask. You can write them in the Q&A feature of the, of the Zoom. Uh, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's Q&A. Just type in your questions and we'll do our best to answer those. Um, so I'm going to quickly share my screen here and uh, show you a little PowerPoint presentation that will talk about the Earth Journalism Network and our approach to uh, supporting um, investigative journalism, especially in East Africa. Um, I guess most of you are familiar with what we are. I, I recognize, I've seen some names uh, of, you, of you who have uh, applied for story grants or, 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 is, or been in our workshops. And so it's great to be with you again. Um, so we really appreciate your interest and your work in this field. So important that you are covering these issues uh, because you can really make a big difference uh, in the way we manage our, our environment and natural resources and helping everyone. So our, uh, our mission at the Earth Journalism Network is to improve the quantity and quality of environmental reporting, including climate change, health issues, and many others uh, by empowering local networks of journalists and individual journalists such as yourselves and focusing especially on regions that maybe don't have all the information they should about these issues. Um, we are a global community at this point. We have now over 12,500 journalists from more than 180 countries around the world. Um, and uh, we are, the topics that we focus on include climate change, certainly, oceans, uh, biodiversity, forests and fisheries, food and agriculture, environmental health, and increasingly doing more issues on environmental health. So, uh, many different topics related to the environment. We work with journalists in all different uh, media formats, print, TV, radio, online, data journalism. And our main activities include trainings and workshops like this webinar, of course. Uh, we give out story grants to individual journalists. So um, we, we recently just uh, offered uh, a call for applications for investigative stories in East Africa. I, and I, I know some of you have applied for that. We'll, we have new, we'll have new application open very soon for biodiversity stories. That should be out. You, you can look on our website for that in the next week or two. Uh, that is a global, uh, global call for, uh, for proposals. So if you have a biodiversity story that you've always wanted to do that takes a little funding, by all means apply for that. We also give out larger grants to partner organizations. As an example, Fred Magira here, one of our, our co-panelists uh, from Water Journalists for Africa has received a, a, a media grant and they're working on a project right now in East Africa. Um, and there are others in Tanzania and elsewhere. Um, we support geojournalism platforms. These are websites, regional websites that focus on environmental news and issues. Uh, and again, uh, I know that Info Nile is, is one such, one example of that. It's a great site. You get a chance to check that out. Um, we give out fellowships to major conferences, like for instance, the climate summits each year. And of course, those many of those conferences this year have been canceled and they've all been canceled because of the pandemic. Uh, we were it was supposed to be a very big year for the environment and for environmental conferences, or is it gonna be big summits on climate change, COP26 in Glasgow, um, the biodiversity COP15 in China, and uh, the UN Ocean Summit was supposed to be held in Lisbon. All those conferences have been postponed probably till next year. Um, and uh, we'll offer fellowships to them. So if you're interested in going, again, look out for the call for proposed for applications and you can apply. It is a very tough competition. We get a lot of 
applications, but by all means, you should you should apply. And finally, we do we support investigative reporting. That's kind of the focus uh, here, is uh, supporting journalists to carry out uh, research and and investigate stories related to the environment and other kinds of special projects. Um, we we work in in addition to our network of individual journalists. We work with uh, many uh, partner organizations, including uh, partners in in Uganda and uh, other in other countries in East Africa. This is just a representative sample of some of them, uh, but the point is we are a network not just of individuals but also of organizations. Um, and here are some numbers and impacts from uh, from the Earth Journalism Network. That actually the numbers are a bit outdated. We have over twelve thousand members now. We've trained over 10,000 journalists and published uh, more than 12,000 stories. But we do keep track of our impacts. So this is increasingly important for journalists, especially if you've ever been supported by a grant or some kind of nonprofit uh, uh, entity, um, is we, we wanna know what is the impact of media on public policies, public debate, public behavior, um, because uh, it's important to to show the world it's important to show the world that the media does have impact on society. As you know, it's difficult these days to be a journalist. It's difficult to run a, a media organization, a news organization. And uh, part of the way that we can help to support ourselves is to show that we have impact, we have influence. And I know that traditionally that is not uh, kind of that not necessarily why we get into journalism. We get into journalism to inform the public and that is still our role. But, um, you know, we do need to keep track of, of what our impact is on society. So here you can see some examples, uh, stories by individual journalists working with EJN have uh, helped expose, for instance, illegally polluting power plants in China that were shut down. In Myanmar, uh, a major dam project was canceled. In Tanzania, a mining project was canceled. Uh, and it's not that we're, we set out to do these things, but it was shown that these uh, projects were damaging. And so society decided to shut them down. The, the, the government there decided to shut them down. Um, and many other examples around the world. And we, we're, we do keep track of those. So if you have examples of how your stories have had impacts, uh, you should let us know and send send the news about that to us, please. Um, so in East Africa, we have some specific activities. Um, right now, this is our main project, is a project called East Africa Wildlife and Conservation Journalism. And the focus, as you can imagine, is on issues related to conservation, wildlife trafficking, also conflicts in the human wildlife interface. And we're also interested in solutions. And that's important that journalists cover not just problems, but also solutions. We've done some workshops. We were planning to, to do, uh, we were planning to hold this round table in person in Uganda, of course, until the pandemic. Now we're doing it all virtually, but someday hopefully we'll be back uh, in person and, uh, and convening together. As I mentioned, we give out story grants and we're giving out grants for investigative journalism um, and, uh, and as well as for to partner organizations. Uh, the ma four main countries involved are Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda. The money, you should always know where the funding is coming from. In this case is coming from the US Agency for International Development, as well as the US Department of Interior that have joined together to provide funding for to support uh, wildlife, sustainable wildlife management. Um, Internews, we have a long-standing history in East Africa. We have offices in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. I don't know that we have an office in Kampala, but I do know we have activities there beyond just this one project. Um, and as I mentioned, we have other programs and activities in the region. We've done workshop, uh, that's, I was in Uganda 10 years ago for a workshop on agriculture. Uh, we've done uh, 
we've supported uh, conferences on climate finance, on, on fisheries in West Africa, uh, and on data journalism as well. Uh, while, let's talk a little bit about wildlife trafficking. That's a major focus of this project. It's a big problem all around the world. Um, it's estimated, uh, well, this was before the pandemic, was estimated that it, it's the, the illegal wildlife trade is worth about $23 billion per year. That would make it the fourth largest illegal trade after trade in uh, drugs, humans, and weapons. But if we include the illegal trade in fishing and in timber, then it's estimated, according to Adrian Reuter, a, a, a researcher, it's estimated $180 billion a year, which would make it the second largest illegal trade only to uh, drugs, second only to drugs. So it's a big problem. And our East Africa is unfortunately a source of supply. It's a transshipment hub. There, there are ports and airports in the region that uh, uh, are where illegal trade passes through. And it's also a region of demand. So there are in some cases people we know, of course, people eat bush meat and other things and and uh, um, and, uh, and this uh, it's an underreported topic there's not a lot of coverage about it usually the only time you ever see it in the news is when there's a bust when there's an arrest and it's you get a small item in the in the newspaper or something or on TV and and then it goes away and nobody ever hears what happens to that case what happened to the traffickers what happened was anyone, uh, were, the, were the people that were arrested, were they convicted? Who was behind it all? Who was receiving the shipments? Uh, there's very little news about that. So one of our goals here is to support more enterprise journalism, more investigative journalism, and, and give it, uh, let the public know the bigger picture about this illegal trafficking. It's not an easy thing to cover. Um, it takes time and money and expertise to do all this. And, you know, journalists often lack those things, unfortunately. Um, there's sometimes resistance within the newsroom. Uh, maybe your editors uh, aren't that interested in the topic. They think it's not so important. There are more important political issues. Uh, so we have to convince and educate our editors and producers and supervisors and make and help help them come aware that this is a uh, really important and dangerous trade and it supports all kinds of nasty, you know, uh, criminals and, uh, you know, it, it needs, it deserves coverage. Um, and then we also get threats from the people, you know, involved in the trade and that we, we very much care for your safety and very much emphasize safe, the importance of safety. So uh, always put your security first. Um, a, a, a good story is not worth your life. So please put your safety first. Um, the um, reporting about what we call charismatic megafauna or you know, uh, popular animals, that, that's quite popular. The audience, uh, our audiences like stories about wildlife but how do you make a good story out of less popular animals like insects or little critters or whatever that might not be quite as attractive but are still very important to the web of life that supports us all that that can be a challenge the bar you know the broader challenge of of reporting on biodiversity is how do you turn this big global issue into a local story a local story that your audience can really relate to and they, they can engage with. So here, here are just a few ideas. And I know our other panelists will be talking about this as well. Um, you know, report on interesting people, the scientists, the conservationists who are working on these issues and, and what drives them, what motivates them, what, what interesting things have happened to them. You can also report on interesting places. You've got many beautiful places in Uganda, precious places, ecosystems, parks, wilderness areas, mountains, forests, you know, uh, what, what makes them so interesting and important? You can report on those things. What are some of the useful or unique characteristics of individual species? As many, many species as we know, you know, especially plants, for instance, are useful as medicines or 
There are many things uh, relating to animals that, that have become the source of inventions and, and that help support our, 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 our biodiversity and our, and our way of life. Uh, so what, you know, report on those things. There's something called a trophic cascade. This is a scientific topic. It's a very important concept that, um, you know, each, uh, each change that we make to an ecosystem uh, cascades down or has an impact that reverberates throughout uh, nature. So one really good example here in my home country in the United States, uh, we have a, a famous national park called Yellowstone National Park. And, uh, you know, 100 years ago, we wiped out one of the apex predators, the, the wolves, from, from, well, from most of the country. Um, and, um, you know, we went and hunted them basically to extinction within the country. Um, and then 25 years ago, uh, there was this decision made to reintroduce wolves uh, into Yellowstone National Park to, to bring them back, basically. And we, th they captured some wolves in, in Canada, brought them to Yellowstone and, and reintroduced them. And we saw this amazing impact uh, in that uh, the animals, the prey animals uh, that we have in North America, the elk, bison, uh, uh, once the wolves were present, they had to be on their guard. They lived, in, they, they had fear. And that fear was really important because it meant they could no longer just eat whatever they wanted or, or you know, they had to watch their surroundings and they, they no longer, for instance, they no longer ate all the young trees and saplings that uh, were growing along the riversides. And so that meant the trees could grow taller. Um, and that meant in turn that there was uh, more shade in the rivers and that in turn led, created more fish habitat. And so you had more fish species uh, returning as well. So just by introducing this one species, reintroducing wolves back into the ecosystem, you had this whole cascade of impacts that became very important and helped to restore the ecosystem to what it was. And of course, it, we have similar examples in Africa. I don't want to take up too much time with this, but it's a very interesting concept and something you can explain to your audiences. And finally, um, you can report on innovative solutions. Sometimes uh, if all we write about is problems, and we know that's uh, often the case, or we know there are a lot of problems out there. Um, People can get frustrated or, or apathetic and, and they say, well, what can we do about it? And so you also need to report on solutions and tie that into your stories and make sure people understand we can solve these problems and we can make things better. Um, so uh, just a little bit about our project. Again, it's, uh, it's a, well, I'm sorry, this is, uh, it's sponsored again by USAID. Um, we, uh, we had investigative story grants uh, and um, we do also do work in other regions such as uh, Europe and Asia as well on wildlife trafficking. We have a, an online map called Wild Eye that you should check out. Although right now it's focused on Europe and Asia. We're trying to get that expanded to uh, Africa as well. Um, there's a biodiversity media initiative I mentioned to you. Again, that's a global initiative, but there is uh, funding available on story grants. Um, and uh, we also support investi investigative stories on other, re other topics like China's Belt and Road Initiative. We've had done a series of stories on the pangolin trade and other types of wildlife trafficking around the world. I'm not gonna go into this in detail now because I wanna wrap up. Um, but there are other ways to engage with EJN. I mentioned the story grants now available, the fellowship possibilities. We have a Google group, a listserv called EJNet. Some of you may be members of that. You're welcome to join that. It's a discussion group. And if you wanna be in touch via email with uh, journalists, there are one th over 1,600 journalists on that Google group and it's a great way to keep in touch and know about all the opportunities that, that are going on.
You should also register on earthjournalism.net if you haven't already. Uh, and check out our Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter feeds, whatever social media you're, you, you engage with, feel free to join us. And so that's it for me for now. Um, thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't go on too long. Uh, and here you, you can see how to contact me. Um, I, there might be some questions and I'm happy to try and answer them, but I'm gonna turn it back to Benon for the moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, James. Um, you know, Uganda has been for a, a long while uh, a transit point for uh, lots of uh, either elephant tasks or, the, or other illegal activity that goes on around the region in South Sudan, in the Congo, in the Central African Republic. And um, we also have, you know, challenges that are increasing right now, um, according to the national, according to National Geographic, uh, during the COVID-19 lockdown period, there has been an increase in illegal wildlife uh, activity and lots of crimes are happening. But there are also journalists who are doing a good job of trying to do these investigations. One of them is Venex Watebawa, who is the team leader for the Water and Environment Media Network. Uh, he has a question for you. He says, we have just been undertaking research with WAP on the grey parrot trafficking, and we discovered much more on other wildlife illegalities. How best can we carry this forward with the Earth Journalism Network? That's a good question. Well, thank you for your research on this. Um, I would say, uh, well, it's a little tricky right now because we we, we closed our call for story grants. And normally I'd say uh, propose a story about this to, to us and we can help support it. I'd still very much encourage you to report on, on, the, um, on the story in the local media. If you feel like you need some support for it, I, I suggest you get in touch with uh, uh, Benon and uh, let him know, we'll see what we can do. Um, but if there's any way we can, you know, if, if you, for instance, if report, you know, produce stories about it in your local media, we can help you to distribute those stories. Um, or if you need uh, other kinds of help, uh, getting information or finding contacts, you know, do reach out to us. I'm not the best person to do that. So I don't want to put too much responsibility on Benon, but that is sort of why we're here. Um, you know, people like Benon and Kiundu in, in, in Kenya, um, we're here to help as best we can. So just let us know how, how we can be of help. Uh, I, I, we can certainly help distribute stories and make people know about what's going on. Okay, thank you, James. Um, James will be with us for at least another 30 minutes. So if you have any questions, uh, uh, in that period, I could chip in and uh, ask uh, in between the presentations. So uh, next, we are going to have Didi Wamukoya, who works with the African Wildlife Foundation. She'll be sharing with us uh, lots of resources from her end. Uh, Didi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Benon. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. I just want to immediately give a disclaimer and say I'm not a journalist. So I'm an environmental lawyer and former wildlife crime investigator and prosecutor. Uh, and as Benon uh, said earlier, I work with African Wildlife Foundation and I lead African Wildlife Foundation's counter wildlife trafficking program. Uh, AWF's counter wildlife trafficking initiatives began in 2014. And right now we have three uh, overarching programs that address this issue. Uh, one is the Canines for Conservation program, whereby we help governments install uh, detection dogs at airports, seaports, and other border posts, as well as tracker dogs within protected areas in order to catch criminals. And then we also have the Wildlife Judicial and Prosecutorial Assistance Program. And this is where we try to sensitize judiciary, prosecution, investigators, and other agencies on wildlife crimes. So we do a lot of training, capacity building, equipping, and sensitization. 
And then uh, our new kid on the block is the Wildlife Cybercrime Investigation Program, which we started last year. And this is because we realized that trade in wildlife and wildlife products was moving online. So I will, uh, I'm giving this disclaimer and this background just so that you understand that my presentation will come from a law enforcement perspective and not a journalism one. So first of all, uh, when you're investigating wildlife crimes, you have to understand that wildlife crime does not occur in isolation. It's, it, they, it, there's usually a trade chain and James alluded to this. So you will not find, for example, somebody on his own just poaching and that's it. There's usually a chain and this chain usually involves, uh, so just like normal businesses, for example, if you are selling avocados, there's the farmer who is the producer, there is a transporter, a middleman, and then there is the manufacturer if it's going to be turned into guacamole or something else. And then there is an exporter if it's moving out of the country and then the final consumer. So similarly in wildlife crime, we have uh, the harvester and this is usually the poacher who goes to the field to poach. And then there is somebody, a transporter or middleman who moves this product from the field uh, to a place where it is warehoused or collected then you have the exporters and importers. These are people, so the exporter moves it out from the source country and the importer moves it across transit countries to the destination country. We have processors or manufacturers. This may either be in the source country or you may find them in the consumer countries. Uh, this is basically the people, for example, who transform rhino horn into a powder because it's consumed as medicine in powder form, uh, for example. And then you have uh, the wholesaler, the retailer in the destination country, and then the, it reaches the consumer and the end user. So when you are telling your story, you need to take the angle, you need to take a specific angle based on this trade chain. Are you talking about the, the poacher? Are you talking about the middleman, the exporter, the consumer? Or are you talking about how this entire chain works? So you need to look at those angles. And so I'll just take an, an overview of the dynamics of wildlife trafficking in East Africa. Um, you'll notice throughout my presentation, I'm, I'm looking at it from a regional perspective, as opposed to Uganda specifically, because uh, trafficking means things are crossing borders illegally. So that is why it's easier to look at it from a regional perspective. So as I said, you need to look at different players in wildlife crime. And so when you look at the source, this is usually the poacher or the first level middleman. Uh, and in many countries, poachers are mainly from local communities adjacent to protected areas. They know the area well. And in some cases, you have communities hosting uh, poachers from elsewhere, maybe neighboring communities or even neighboring countries. Uh, so like in the case of South Africa, you'll find most of the rhino horn poachers are Mozambicans. So they come from a neighboring country. And then the first level middleman usually provides logistics, you know, the lower level logistics for the poacher that is, for example, intelligence, where are the rangers today? You know, where is the surveillance taking place today? They sometimes help to move uh, illegal firearms, guns from maybe the, main, the kingpin to the poacher. So they help move guns to the poacher, move supplies. They also help to pay the poachers. So to move money to the poacher so that the poacher can go and execute the crime. And so you'll find that this, uh, this uh, middlemen also help to transport from the field uh, to the collection points. So they use the normal modes of transport like vehicles, uh, but most now frequently we are seeing them using motorbikes because motorbikes can go through what we call the uh, Kenya routes here. I don't know what you call them in Uganda. So they go through other routes. They can escape the main roads very easily. Sometimes you'll find them using, uh, using a local means of transport, for example, donkey carts. Uh, there was a case which I witnessed whereby there was a donkey cart which was pro, uh, transporting gallons of water, but inside those gallons, there was no water. It was actually pieces of ivory which were concealed. So they also take advantage of local means of transport. Then the ivory moves to collection points. So here you have higher level middlemen. Uh, and these are the ones who consolidate the shipments. So for example, if they want to ship it uh, by sea or by air, they can containerize it or if they're using human mules, then you'll find that they're the ones who are in connection with the people, the mules who can uh, move 
are within airports, seaports, you know, using or using road or other means of transportation undetected. Um, so these urban based middlemen are usually much bigger operatives and they also engage the exporters. Then you have the exit point. So this is uh, where the, so just to mention Uganda is actually a collection point. It's not necessarily a source when it comes to wildlife trafficking, it's a collection point. So from a collection point, uh, like in Uganda, it now moves to exit points. Um, the, the most commonly used exit point for wildlife products from Uganda is uh, Kenya. So you'll find them going by road uh, up to Mombasa port whereby they now move out by sea. So a characteristic of the recent ivory trade is the movement of large volumes of ivory uh, using uh, shipping containers by road, by sea or by air at one time. And so this also involves higher level of planning than the local middleman, higher level of organization and intelligence. It also requires greater levels of finance because you have to pay for these shipments. You have to invest in facilities and equipment for storage and shipping purposes. And you also have to develop trade links with uh, destination markets, say in Asia and so on. So, when now you're looking at these dynamics, one of the things you will see are uh, when you're reporting a weak legislative environment. So a weak legislative environment is one of the things that actually exacerbates the illegal wildlife trade. So investigations are useless with weak legislation. So an angle of the story you may want to tell as a journalist is why is there a lot of trafficking in, in a specific country or a specific site could the legislation be weak and maybe try and get the attention of policymakers to strengthen the laws? Legislation must be enforceable and must have deterrent penalties. So for example, the countries there in green, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, um, they have uh, deterrent penalties for wildlife crimes. Uh, Uganda and Kenya have life imprisonment for crimes involving endangered species, whereas Tanzania treats wildlife crimes as economic crimes and has imprisonment for 30 years without the option of a fine. However, we'll see surrounding countries, the countries which are there in red, actually have very low penalties. A country like Ethiopia has a fine of uh, about 1,400 US dollars for a wildlife crime. DRC has even lower penalties under a thousand dollars for crimes involving wildlife. And so you will find that uh, which, I mean, illegal criminal networks will therefore move around to countries that have uh, lesser penalties so that they can avoid prosecution or they can avoid paying hefty fines or hefty penalties. Here is an, in a, in an illustration about what I'm talking about. So this is just data from our Canines for Conservation program. So in 2016, we installed detection dogs at airports in Kenya and uh, in Tanzania, and you can see the levels of crime were a bit high, the fines were a bit high. And then uh, in 2017, they were going lower, especially after the countries tightened their, legis their legislation. But you can see in Uganda, when we installed the dog program in 2017, the crime was very, very high. So this could be attributed to the low penalties in Uganda at the time. And secondly, it could be attributed to uh, the, fact that, the fact that there was no dog program there before. So actually traffickers had been taking advantage of uh, Entebbe International Airport. But over the years, and especially in 2019, when Uganda strengthened its legislation, you can see a very sharp drop in wildlife crimes in Uganda in uh, illegal trafficking through Entebbe International Airport. So you can see a very sharp drop, and this could be attributed to the fact that this, the penalties are now stronger. In 2020, you can see all the three countries have lower wildlife crime detection, and this is mostly because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, whereby transportation has been reduced. Uh, international flights, for example, were stopped for, for some time. So another thing that uh, exacerbates uh, trafficking is the silo approach to law enforcement. So maybe when you're telling your story, you can tell it from the angle, you can look at it from the angle of who, for example, is working with Uganda Wildlife Authority uh, to deal with this issue. So the problem we find with law enforcement is you'll find the wildlife agency is trying hard to deal with this issue because it's their mandate, but the customs authority or the police are really not interested. And therefore this crime goes on undetected. 
So we need to get all the agencies working together in order to deal with this uh, kind of crime. And then uh, uh, James mentioned this in his presentation. We have a proliferation of transnational criminal networks in the region. So these are criminals who deal in uh, human trafficking. They deal in uh, terrorism, like the Al-Shabaab, for example. They deal in small arms. They deal in cybercrime, drugs, for example, and money laundering. So these criminal networks also deal in wildlife crime. So wildlife crime is not something unique where you'll find a new criminal network that comes up that dealing specifically in wildlife crime. It's the same criminal networks, but they do take advantage of wildlife crimes because of the low risk and high gains involved in wildlife trafficking. Low risk and high gains, why? Because for a long time, not only in East Africa, but in Africa generally, Wildlife crime has not been at the top of priority for governments. Our penalties have always been low. Funding has always gone to other sectors to fight other kinds of crime, like drugs, for example, murder, and other penal offenses, but not wildlife crimes. So it becomes easy because once you're arrested for a wildlife crime, you can easily pay the, the fine and move, and move on. It doesn't have a high stigma, for example, like somebody who is transporting a cache of firearms or for example, a terrorist or a drug peddler. So the, the stigma is also low on the criminal. So an example is a, of a criminal network is the 2011 Lemton Guy case in South Africa. I don't know if you've read about it, but this was a case of a Thai uh, kingpin who was using human trafficking in order to exacerbate illegal wildlife trade. So what he was doing is he was paying Thai prostitutes to come to South Africa as if they're on a hunting holiday. So they come as sport hunters, they get hunting licenses. Uh, they hunt rhino, elephant or whatever animal, they get the license to hunt. And then because they were allowed to take the trophy back home, so they take the trophy back home. And then now they're using illegal means or exploiting the hunting permits in South Africa, but through using human trafficking, in order to be able to illegally move wildlife products from the continent. Uh, we also have connectivity of Eastern Africa uh, to the world. Eastern Africa, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, Ethiopia especially are major transport hubs uh, on the continent. Uh, as you can see on the map here in the middle, uh, Africa is connected to other continents by air and by sea. And we have, for example, more than 100 airlines operating in Africa today. According to IASA, the top 10 fast and growing aviation economies for the next 20 years will be in Africa. So this connectivity will grow, it will become even wider. Uh, before the COVID pandemic, we had 1,200 daily flights from the continent and 126 million passengers per year. So you can see the loopholes or the openings for moving wildlife products through human, human mules by air. On the bigger map here on the left, uh, you can see the transportation networks by road and by sea, whereby ivory moves across the continent and then out of the continent and into consumer countries. So because of our connectivity, um, we are, you can see wildlife products moving uh, very rapidly across the continent and also to other, I mean, to the destination countries. So you can tell your story by actually following a wildlife product and how it moves from the source through a transit country, exiting the continent and onto consumer countries. Um, another problem we suffer is weak trade controls. Um, and this is mostly ignorance of not only law enforcers but also journalists on illicit goods. So you'll find that many people are not aware about the CITES, that's the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species and on the CITES permitting process, as well as on which wildlife products may be traded under CITES and which may not be traded under CITES. So you'll find products moving as if they're CITES uh, products, and especially uh, plant products like rosewood, sandalwood, you'll find them moving across the continent and into, onto destination markets, just because law enforcers are not aware that these are actually CITES listed species and should not be moved without the relevant permits. Another challenge we face is corruption uh, within the region. 
uh, corruption and collusion between private sector and government regulatory agencies. So these are law enforcement agencies. So the corruption, the corrupt acts fall within the broad categories of bribery, patronage, diplomatic cover and permit abuse. So bribery, that is why you're basically bribing a law enforcement agency to, to, to look the other way and not see your products being moved across. Uh, an example is was last year or the year before last where the machine, the scanners in Dar es Salaam International, the, International Airport in Dar es Salaam were actually shut down. Uh, unfortunately for the operators, the president himself went to visit the airport and to look at the scanners and he found that they had been shut down. There was no report that they were not working, no report had been made. So it was actually a corrupt dealing and he took action immediately. So that is an example of bribery. You have patronage, whereby you have, for example, um, some law enforcement, unscrupulous law enforcement agencies on the payroll of uh, organized criminal groups. Uh, you have diplomatic cover, and this has happened uh, when we started the dog program in 2016 in Uganda. The, the dog actually detected ivory in a diplomatic bag. And you know, under international law, you cannot open a diplomatic bag. So it, re it created a lot of problems. So we have seen people using diplomatic bags to commit crimes. And then permit abuse, like the example I've given about the South African Thai case. Um, so, and you also find that wildlife trafficking processes also sit within already corrupt structures and, facil and facilitate crimes of all kinds. So it's not only wildlife crime that is being facilitated. You'll find human trafficking, arms, drugs trafficking is being facilitated by this corruption. So wildlife trafficking comes and just sits on these processes that are already in place. Uh, we also have corrupt criminal justice systems whereby judicial officers can be paid to give lesser penalties or to look the other way and acquit offenders. Or you have a political environment whereby the political class is really not interested in wildlife crime. There's no political buying or political will in fighting this crime. Lastly, we have cyber-enabled cyber crime. Uh, this includes web-based crime, social media, you know, taking advantage of social media to commit crime, uh, use of mobile banking, and also use of digital and electronic devices to commit uh, crimes. So wildlife products are being used, are being sold through the internet and social media platforms. I'm sure now if you go to your Facebook and just type in ivory or rhino horn for sale, you may find some advert or somebody. And especially you will find live animals such as being sold for pets, such as birds, you know, uh, lizards, butterflies, you'll find them on your social media platforms. Somebody who is in your friend, in your network, actually advertising these things for sale. An example of uh, wildlife trafficking in the black market is the Silk Road. I don't know if you've heard about it, but Silk Road was an online black market, uh, the first to be seen in the modern darknet market. And it was best known for selling illegal drugs, but wildlife products also moved onto this platform. It was launched in uh, 2011 and modern, I mean, online users on this site were able to browse it anonymously and securely without, their poten without being monitored by the law enforcement. So uh, an example is there was a rhino horn seller from Namibia who was using this site and he was offering his rhino horn for sale by using the tag pure keratin hunted in Namibia. So as you'll know, rhino horn is made actually, is actually hair, so it's made out of keratin, just like the same material in your hair and in your nails. So to avoid the keyword rhino horn being found by law enforcers who are surfing the net, he decided to use pure keratin hunted in Namibia. So buyers could understand. So most internet purchases will reach consumers using courier or postal services anywhere in the world. So besides looking at air, looking at ship, you also need to look at our postal and courier, courier companies uh, when you're doing your journalistic investigations as potentials for illegal wildlife trade. We also have mobile money transfer that is easing transactions, especially during this COVID period where use of physical cash is being discouraged and we have people moving on to uh, electronic platforms to transfer money. We have other digital devices being used by uh, poachers and traffickers such as drones, GPSs, etc. 
uh, to be able to make it easier for them to commit these crimes. So investigations must also move from physical trade, that is the physical buyer and physical seller, and also look at the online trade. So that is all. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Okay, thank you, Didi. Um, I think the presentation by Didi just shows us the wide range of sources that we can have, uh, not just in Uganda, but across the region. So Didi is based in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. She works with the African uh, Wildlife Foundation. You can reach out to people like Didi for different uh, um, in bits of information that may not be available to Ugandan organizations. Uh, we're almost uh, up to the top of the hour. Uh, so James could be leaving us. He's answered a lot of questions already in the chat box. Uh, but I will just have one more question for James before he leaves. Um, two, two of our colleagues uh, listening to you have asked uh, questions to do with the safety and security of journalists who investigate environmental crime. Uh, Venex and Sarah are saying environmental reporters in Uganda are increasingly being targeted both by state security agencies and uh, environmental criminals. What would be your advice to them on the, how to deal with such a fluid security and safety situation for journalists? Thank you for the question. Yeah, this is a, a difficult problem uh, in Uganda and really everywhere. Uh, it's, uh, first of all, we, we again stress that we wanna put your safety first. So, um, uh, you know, don't take risks unnecessarily. Some of the things you can do is work as a group or as a team. Um, and if you feel, if you, for instance, if you have to travel somewhere that you think uh, may be risky and you really feel like you have to go. Um, uh, make sure you stay in touch with your colleagues and you know, uh, check in with them every day. Uh, so, um, and make sure that uh, they know where you are, how to reach you so that um, you know, if there is a problem, they can follow up with you. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know what it's like to work with the police in Uganda, if, that, if it's, if it's a good idea to to inform, inform them, I you know that is normally what we would do in other countries. Uh, maybe our Ugandan colleagues can speak more on that. Uh, um, and uh, but the main thing I would say, I also want to tell you about other groups out there that help work with journalism safety. There's the Committee to Protect Journalists. You should check them out. There's Reporters Without Borders. They also uh, help journalists on safety issues. So look up their websites and see see what they suggest. But the main thing I would say is, you know, work as a team. This is why uh, well, I used to be based in Thailand and uh, we also faced issues with journalism safety. And, uh, you know, when we had to travel or we felt there was a risky situation, we would, I would inform uh, my newspaper and our newspaper did have legal aid support uh, and other kinds of support that would help with safety issues. So if you're working for a media organization, please do make sure you're, 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 you have uh, those resources uh, and that you're talking to your editors, supervisors. But you can also work as a team. Uh, and one of the things we did in Thailand was we helped set up the Thai Society of Environmental Journalists, which was a group of journalists who are dedicated to covering environment, kind of like EJN, but on a country level. And uh, we would help exchange, help each other. We'd exchange information. We do training webinars and workshops. Uh, we would do, um, you know, and, and, you know, if there was a problem with safety, we would, as a group, go to the authorities and let them know. And sometimes, and when you work as a group, especially if you're representing a lot of the country's media, then the police or the authorities, they have to pay some attention to it. If you're on your own, then it becomes much more difficult. So I think that is the main thing I would say uh, overall is to work, you know, when, when there are safety issues, bring it to the attention of not just the police or the authorities, but bring it to the attention of journalism groups and other larger networks, or even create those networks that can give you more strength. There's always strength in numbers. So 
please try and work together on this. I hope that's been a little bit of help. Okay, thank you, James. Um, in the interest of time, I will straight away go to Esther Nakazi, who is uh, an experienced uh, science uh, journalist. She's written about the environment. Uh, she has, uh, she's run her own blogs. Uh, she's the, the president of the Health Journalist Network for Uganda. And she is a trainer uh, for internews in South Sudan. Um, so Esther has re is really bringing in vast experience, uh, looking at different ways of uh, reporting and doing investigations. And she'll share with us uh, starting, I think, now, because she has her slide already open. Esther, please. Esther, your slide, your slides are open. Uh, please go ahead. You might be muted, Esther. Please check. Yeah. Wow. Okay, there you are. You can hear me now. Yes, we can. Okay, um, that's good. It's five o'clock. Um, thank you very much for the kind introductions, Benon, and thank you, James and Frederick and Didi, uh, for being on the panel with me. Um, I'm really honored to be here. And Didi, you really made my work easy because you have sort of gone through the basics of um, of what is entailed. Uh, so I'll, I'll straight away go to the first slide, which, which is about investigating wildlife and uh, environmental uh, crime in Uganda. And this basically requires two arms, investigating crime or corruption. So if you're going to be investigating wildlife crime, one of the things you're going to be looking at is investigating corruption and crime and two, you should be able to interpret policies and guidelines. Um, guidelines and policies uh, keep changing all the time. Um, countries come up with new policies all the time. They keep changing them. And it, it is in your best interest as a journalist to, to get uh, acquitted with these uh, updated, up, updated, um, updated uh, policies, sorry. Okay. Yeah, next slide. Wow, I can't move to my next slide. What's going on? I can't move to my next slide. Esther, I think you'll go ahead. We'll try to uh, share from, uh, let me ask if uh, Stefano can share the slides from his end. Okay. But uh, let, let's go ahead. Uh, Esther, please go ahead. Um, I'm trying to set up so that you can, I can share from my end. Okay, so my slides are on my laptop and uh, how do I do this? Oh my God. Uh, no, Esther, you, please go ahead with the slides. We are going to share the the, the presentations uh, with everyone who is attending. So even when they missed out on 
the presentations, they will, be, they will be able to receive them and once again, go through them. Okay, um, so, so I've got one problem, uh, yes. Benon. Kindly bear with me some, um, yeah, okay, this is okay. So um, I've lost my video though, so I can't see you. But we can hear you. Uh, you can ahead. hear me. Okay, yes. no problem. So when we are investigating uh, 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 environmental crime in Uganda, we look at what is the story. And Didi has very much explained this. You look at the poacher, the middleman, the source, the, the, the consumer. She has gone through this very well. And I may not, I may not want to, to really uh, do that, but you need a pre-planning if you're going to do environmental crime reporting. So sit down with your editor, sit down with your, talk, with your team, brainstorm on the story, keep meeting and updating each other, organize information, have a strategy on what exactly you want to do and plan the execution, identify sources, access the situation and please take notes when you are in the field. There is no person that I know in, in Uganda who does taking notes like Gerard Tenwa and he's on this call and he's one of the best uh, environmental journalists we have in this country. Um, so when you're, when you're planning, think about what your story is. Like Didi has explained, what is your story? Every time you go to the field, think about what your story is. How do you want to execute this story? And what sources do you, do you intend to talk to? There are so many sources out there if you're going to do environmental um, crime reporting, but sit down and understand who brings value to your story? Who adds content to your story? How far can you go? Do a risk assessment. There are so many risks in environmental reporting, environmental crime reporting like you have had. Um, People, uh, uh, Venex has just told you, journalists in Uganda being targeted. I have heard stories from Tenua being targeted because of doing a story ABCD. So if you are going to do this, do a risk assessment, understand how do you keep safe? What do you need to keep safe? How are you going to, to go about this in case you get into trouble? So come up with a strategy, talk to your editor, talk to your Media House, some of us are freelancers. It's unfortunate that um, you may not have a team on the ground, but still, I think you still have a media house that you can report to and tell them, this is what I'm going to do today. I'm going to, the, to, the, to meet the poachers or I'm going to be embedded. I'm going to, to, to do ABCD and have cover up and put a, uh, you know, give them a time slot of where you are and what you're doing. So environmental reporting or investigative reporting during COVID-19 has had challenges. Uh, we all know that during environmental report, uh, when we're doing environment reporting or investigating reporting, we pretty much need to go to the sources, but we have had emergency laws which have been inst instituted, which entailed lockdowns, curfews, social distancing, Meeting different sources has been difficult. And so timelines have been trampled upon. So you may want to submit your story in a certain given time, but well, because of the emergency laws that we are put across because of COVID-19, it has been almost impossible. And then access. It was difficult. It has been difficult to get accuracy, to verify information. Safety has been a problem because of, you know, what is going on and funding. There are low budgets right now. Media houses have been laying off staff and then there have been laws that have been uh, put up by the state in terms of who publishes and how they can penalize you. So budgets are really low and funding, doing environmental reporting and investigative reporting really needs funding. So. I think earth journalism comes in handy. Um, so once you are in the field, 
what are the reporting tools that you may need? One of the tools that you, you, you really have to look at is use the, the tradition of reporting tools, really. Look at, observe, observe what is going on, interview the community, follow trends, look at what is unusual. If there's anything unusual, try to identify that and follow it through because like did you say, you'll see all these motor, motor border borders riding around and what are they carrying? What is inside there? That is an unusual event. If there are so many border borders coming out of the forest or coming out of something and they're carrying something that you, you need to identify, <coughs> sorry. Um, look out for the mysteries and the unknowns and try to look at what important people or places and things that are happening. So look for basically all of you who are on the call know these things. Traditional reporting tools can be deployed. And what sources do we consider for investigative reporting? You have done this, most of you look at the communities, look at NGOs, look at the academia, look at government ministries and agencies, um, listen to court hearings. Religious leaders can be very good and cultural leaders. Statements by people in authority can give you a lead about what is going on. News agencies, look at uh, news releases on government organizations, look out for data. There's a lot of data that is coming out. Um, so much ivory is being exported right now. Look at that data and try and go into the story. Look at the commerce and the trade. Um, again, Didi has just given us an, given us an example of, of that in terms of mobile money and, and all that. Look at the campaigns that are going on. There are organizations that look out for rights of, of, of people. So look out, the, look out for campaigns and events that are going on. And please be online and try to understand what is going on. <coughs> Sorry. So um, still sources to consider for investigations reporting. Studying sources for investigations, try and look out for neglected sources. They are sources that want to be anonymous and we shall speak a little bit about going undercover or being embedded. So if you're going to be embedded, what exactly do you need to do? Identify what the person fit from you. It is important that if you're going to go as a businessman who, who is going to buy this ivory, you will need to, and you will need to to convince the people who are going to give you this information that you're actually a businessman and they're going to benefit this from you. So you have the cash, you look like you have the cash, dress like you have the cash and talk like you have the cash so that this person, the people you're going to investigate can sort of tally with you and, and, and give you the information freely. Uh, because you want to keep safe and because we have talked about it, please try and share the location that you are at. Um, James has emphasized this and we cannot emphasize this enough, but don't be a target for uh, uh, organized criminals because they have everything. They have guns, they know what to do. They are ruthless and believe in your cover. If you're going in as a business person, keep it, you know, keep it business-like. You are a business person dressed like that and look like that and be respectful, don't be violent. The people you're dealing with in environmental crime are already criminals. If you become violent, they can be violent too. So try and be respectful and get what you want and get out of there. Um, I think I, I, I want to believe, or I'll, to, I'll ask Tenya to speak briefly about this or give us a perspective, but I think you want to do it in the public interest. So the story that you're doing is for public interest. Try and give, you know, the details that will benefit people 
give them a solution and believe in the story like we said earlier. After the investigation is done, gather your notes, interviews, and research into a file. And it is important that you keep this information because you know that sometimes investigative reporting also may land you into court well into trouble. So you want to keep all this information gathered, well stored, and you have something to, to show people in case they take you to court. Review your notes, look for a common theme, and search for good quotes or interesting facts, and also develop focus. Because you may, you may be out there and you have all this information, you've been out there for a week, and you have collected a lot of information, try to get a focus, try to, to have a common theme that you, you, which, what is the story? In the back of your head, you're thinking about that. Um, risk assessment, after the investigation, back up all the information, we have already talked about that. And uh, when you're going to, to unveil the story as a media house, try and promote the story. Tweet about it, WhatsApp it, do a podcast, put it through multimedia so that by the time the public gets the story, they are really eager and you have eyeballs following your story, you have put a lot of effort into it and there are people ready to, to comment, read it and receive it. Um, sometimes, or I have read and sometimes I do that, blog on how you did the investigation. People would love to know how did you go about the story? Some media houses offer space to do that, but you can typically have your own blog and give as much information as you want. Um, give feedback as much as possible. If you're done with your story, don't just sit back and you know, relax. People are interested in what you did and they will be asking for feedback. And lastly, look at the impact of the story. Like um, Jem said, I think uh, most of these environmental, <coughs> environmental crime stories or investigative stories create an impact in terms of policy, in terms of actions, in terms of what people do. So try as much as possible to look for the impact and show it to the world because you have done a great job anyway. I think that's it from me. Okay, thank you, Esther. It seems like your ideas were coming a lot faster without the presentation. So thanks for what? your uh, presentation. Um, in For everyone who missed out on uh, Esther's presentation, we will be sharing it um, after the webinar. Um, so look out in your emails for that. Um, now, in the interest of time, again, I will just uh, go straight to Frederick, who has uh, a presentation. I hope this time around we won't have tech glitches that will prevent us from seeing the good stuff that you have packaged for us. Uh, Frederick, please go ahead and share your screen. And when you're ready, uh, you can speak to us. Thanks. Um, hello? Yeah, I've just yes, shared my screen. I hope you. you can see it. Are you able to see yes, my screen? Can. We can hear you, we can see your screen. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Benon. Uh, thank you, Esther. I, you know, uh, uh, the stuff that you have said is almost what I wanted to say. I'll just build on what you have said. Uh, thank you, Didi. And uh, we hope to work with you more on most of these projects. I will get your contact and we can talk uh, a business. So um, what I did when I was asked to talk about uh, tools and techniques, so I decided to use uh, the example of what we are doing at InfoNile. I, I am so glad I've seen most of uh, our network members, most of the journalists in the region, Uganda, Kenya, that have given grants at InfoNile. I've just seen them here. So most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about is what you know. Eh? Yeah, so InfoNile is a, a geojournalism project. Uh, I hope I can share my screen. Oh yeah. So uh, I come from InfoNile. I'm the co-founder of InfoNile and InfoNile is a project of Water Journalists Africa. Water Journalists Africa 
is a network of about 700 journalists in Africa. They come from about 50 countries. It's a project I started uh, with the other colleagues in South Africa. So at Infonai, we are about 400 cross-border geojournalists uh, with a mission to uncover political stories and water issues in the 11 countries of the Nile Basin. So we do that through uh, data-based multimedia storytelling. Uh, so th this this is the, the so I'm going to show you how we are doing this through uh, the techniques and tools that we use, so that you as journalists you can be able to pick one or two or three that have made us you know successful and have been, um, made us uh, be able to win various grants and you know also and um, journalism awards as I tell you. So uh, what we do at Infonile, we publish original collaborative investigative geojournalism projects on undercover issues of water and the environment in the Nile Basin. Again, these are 11 countries in the Nile Basin that we've been working with. Uh, there are, that's where our 400 journalists, most of you guys have seen, uh, that's where you fall. So some of the projects that we've done, um, uh, we did a project called Sucked Dry. Uh, this uh, uh, it, it's an award-winning project that you know recently won a project for the whole of the continent of Africa uh, due to this project that we did. So we had the, a group of about eight journalists from uh, across the region who worked on different stories about land grabbing in their countries. And so we were able to, uh, they were able to publish these stories. We gave them journalism grants, they published these stories and we were able to bring them together. Uh, in the interest of time, I will not go to a uh, Sack to Dry project, but you guys can always check it, check it out. If uh, you Google it, you find it. It's an amazing project. Uh, it is in the same uh, style that we did uh, Swamp City. Swamp City was the first one. It came first before Sack to Dry and uh, also Swamp City uh, won, um, uh, an award, uh, we took the award of the best uh, uh, wash, wash uh, uh, journalism, something in Uganda, that's about two years ago. Uh, you, you guys know the wash uh, awards. Yeah, so what we, uh, it, again, what we do, we provide sort of grants to journalists to conduct data-based water journalism projects. James has just told you that he, uh, you know, they supported us and they are continuing to support us. They gave us a grant and you know, when these guys, uh, the funders give us uh, grants, we are able to give uh, such a grant also to journalists. We, uh, we send out the call for protections and you know, uh, journalists supply and then we give them you know, these grants. Eh? So we also mentor and train journalists in data journalism and science communication. We create interactive maps and data visualizations on key issues of water, environment, and climate change. I'm just giving you all of this as a background of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, you know what you can use as, as, as tools and techniques while investigating uh, wildlife stories. Because I strongly believe that it is important for me to show you how we did it so that you can learn one or two, not to give you theories, but to show you that this is something that you guys can do. If you are able to do it, yes, you can do it. Yeah? So I just want to give you uh, an example of the project that the uh, Internews Earth Journalism Network had funded uh, that we are implementing. We are actually in uh, the evening hours of this project. So when you got a grant at the beginning of this year, we about a grant from Earth Journalism Network, we sent out a call for applications. And so we got about 24 journalists who applied. This is a project that focuses on wildlife reporting. You know, we are looking at uh, how, for example, COVID has affected wildlife. We are looking at you know, solutions, journalism stories of how, you know, uh, what is helping to conserve you know, wildlife in, in, the, in the region. In, uh, uh, in Kenya. In South Sudan and Rwanda. We got about 20 minutes to our pride and we gave them uh, grants. We trained them. We trained them. For, we had five, we had the training of five weeks. So we trained them every week. We give them two hours. This is a session that we uh, had with our colleagues. 
our partners at Code for Africa. So we trained them in wide drive reporting, solutions journalism, and other journalism. Then later, at the end of the five weeks, we gave uh, journalism grants to 10 uh, journalists to go out and do stories. And so now uh, the, 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 these journalists now are in the process of editing their stories, you know, data visualization and publishing you know, their stories. Again, uh, as I told you, we've been, been able to do this through uh, uh, with our partners, and that's good for Africa. So now we are, we are also at a stage of, of production of a bigger project focused on COVID-19 and wildlife. You know how, for example, COVID-19 has affected wildlife in the region, you know, the parks, you know, what does it mean? You know, for the last month that some of the parks were closed, what does it mean to them? The parks, you know, to the to neighboring communities and things of that nature. So now, I go to the point now. You, I, I told you we gave out journalism grants to, uh, to journalists in the in East Africa to go out and do stories. And so we have been mentoring them, we work with them, and we so we see what they're doing, we edit. Yeah, so the first technique that I realized will work for you and which has worked for us is strategic partnerships for impactful reporting. You see now, when you guys are reporting on these issues, uh, Didi has been telling us about uh, traffic, trafficking. It does, it does not just go through one country, it goes through several countries. You need strategic partnerships with you know, your fellow journalists in different countries. I also give an example of, uh, if, for example, you wanted to report about the mountain gorillas. If, you're, if you can be able to collaborate with your friends in, uh, in Rwanda, in Biara, Congo, to do an impactful uh, story. This, this is a bigger story. This is the stuff that we've been doing, uh, like we did at Sack to Dry when we worked with eight journalists in the region to do a, to a big story that you know, later won an award. This is something that you can do. I think also it can help in, in the process of you know, the safety of, of journalists. If you are not able to go there, you are correct, for example, in Rwanda or in Dira Congo, we will go there for you and do the story. So you, you can be able to work on this. I, I know some of you guys will ask about, you know, things to do with the sharing bylines, you know, uh, also probably media houses are compete, competing with each other. They do not want to share, you know, stories. But those are things, those are, those are secondary. Yeah, yeah, you must know your know, aim of reporting on this is not just for you to make money, but, you know, the end result, what do you want the story to, to, to care your community? Again, uh, if you went to dry, we'll see how we use the settler imagery. I think uh, you talked about something related to this. It's important for you to use satellite imagery. And uh, uh, this is almost free online. You, you need to go to, uh, if, for example, you went to Google Maps and looked for the, uh, the place that you want to, uh, you want to get a satellite map. You may need to go to uh, Google Maps and then look for the place. And if you clicked, the, if you right clicked, you get the coordinates. If you feed these coordinates, for example, into Google Earth, you you'll be able to you know get uh, a satellite imagery of this area. You may want to show how what has happened in time. Eh? For example, you may want to take uh, 10 years and see what has happened. If you did, for example, time elapse, and you, I mean, if you used Google time elapse and you wanted to show what happened in this national park uh, in uh, 2090 and up to now, you'll be able to, to, to show this. And then again, you can uh, uh, juxtapose these images, to show how it was uh, in 10 years ago and how it is. You'll be able to tell your story very well. For example, if you want to show what's happening to conservation, what has happened to uh, these parks, for example, uh, as you know, climate change is sad, uh, well, global warming, you'll be able to use satellite imagery to bring out the fact of the story. We did this again with the, our Swamp City, uh, the story that looked at uh, 
um, Najibubo wetland, and we showed what it was uh, about 20 years ago and how it is, how it has been you know, encroached on, and how your communities have built in it, and it was a perf uh, perfect. It's so amazing for you to show, to use you know, pictures, you know, uh, images to show what has happened. It just tells the story on its own. Eh? Yeah, so again, I think Didi, you talked about drones. If these uh, poachers are using drones, yeah, why don't we as journalists also use drones to uh, get images, for example, of what's happening to our national parks? You're able to use drones. I, I know now it's a bit hard to bring in a drone. Uh, you must uh, uh, get a license for you to get the drone into Uganda. I, I mean, pass at the, at the interior. This has happened to me several times. You know, they have to ask when you or you have a license to bring in a drone. But I know there's drone pilots, several drone pilots are across the country who can, you know, do it for you at a cheaper price, one hundred dollars, you know, uh, probably uh, like I know other guys who charge about two hundred thousand dollars. You know, but you must know what you want, and you you work with this drone journalist to get you these images, and these images also would be perfect for you to tell this story. Again, I think uh, Esther talked about data. You must use data. There are so many places where I can get this data. And you must use, in your stories, you must use data. And this uh, data will make you, will bring out the credibility of your story to be easy to understand. Because when you use this data, you don't only just uh, you know, give figures. You may need to go ahead and, uh, and visualize it. You, know, you can use pie charts, you can use... Uh, uh, graphs like you saw what did he was doing. Scientists use this all, most of the times. I think that's where we should also be going as journalists. So you will need to put your news in context and must use data. There are so many places where you can go and get that. And I think uh, that's where we are heading. So the other point I wanted to uh, focus on is mapping. You, uh, I, I know this is a new area for us as journalists, especially in Uganda, who have not studied things to do with GIS. But this is something that we can try out. You can map. You can map, for example. I would just I want to make this as simple as possible. I, I hope we can get it. Take an example of maps in Uganda. I mean, the map, uh, national parks in Uganda, national parks and, ga and game reserves in Uganda. And so you, if you are able to map them, on, map of Uganda and again had a layer on this map showing the um, cases of uh, poaching in these national parks. So this is a layer onto, uh, I mean a layer onto the map. The, the map you had first was the national parks and then you're able now you have figures, you, you have already gotten data and you're able to map this data onto uh, the national parks and you want to show us we have different national parks, Kidepo and you know, stuff like that. And then you are able to do another layer showing cases of, of, for poaching, for example. And you want to show us uh, which, uh, for example, a national park in Uganda has had you know, increasing cases of, of poaching. These are things that I encourage you guys to uh, venture into. We've done this at the Info Nile and you, if you went to infonile.org, you'll be able to see this. It's amazing work that you know, you, we can all take on. And it brings out the story in a, a, in a better perspective. And, you, know, you are able to attract uh, uh, readers and you, know, you tell the story in, a, a, in, a, in kind of a, a better style, eh? a new style. And uh, so you attract readers. And you know, as you attract readers, as you attract the audience, you are likely to attract the, the people who can go ahead and take uh, action. You know, so uh, all these, as you can see, point to geojournalism. Uh, uh, we've been doing geojournalism now for about four, four to five years. At now, now geojournalism is just like what I've just told you. You, you. you use location data generated by earth sciences. Now you would want to know what earth sciences are. Uh, this is the study of uh, the planet earth. So as you use, you know, uh, satellite imagery, you know, you use uh, 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 like Google time apps, all of this that you'll be doing uh, feeds into geojournalism. Yes. So uh, this is my last slide. I just wanted to, uh, again, give you an insight of uh, what you, as, as Esther told you, you must do a 
lot of investigation, especially when you are un, when we are under lockdown or you, when you are not able to go to the field. And on, online, there are so many platforms where you can do these investigations. Take an example of open corporates. If you went there, you would, it, this would let you know, uh, find more information about the company. Now, uh, did it told you uh, people, uh, there are people and companies that come to uh, these national parks, you know, that take the, that they do post, take what has been poached. Eh? So you would want to find out which company is this, where is it registered, who are the owners, and you know, stuff like that. And if you went to open corporates, you'll be able to find several, I think so many, I don't remember the number, but there are so many, if you check to their website, there are so many companies that are, they have info about these companies and you know who are the directors and you know, where is it best, what does it you know, uh, engage in, and you'll be able to get more info as you work on your stories. Then Source for Africa, uh, I mean Source Africa, we have worked with Source Africa for several times. Source Africa is uh, one of the uh, partners that you know, worked on Source Africa. Uh, code for Africa. So we we uh, we worked with the uh, source, source Africa several times, and on, on Source Africa, you are able to to find uh, uh, um, documents, different documents, and these di documents are uploaded by individuals, not not for example Source Africa. Divine. If you went and opened uh, an account, you would be able to upload your documents as a journalist. For example, if you are able, if you are investigating and you, why you, you, you land on a document, you can read through and then upload it. You can use it as a store, your store for these documents. You will need it next time. Just not, you, I mean, you don't just read and uh, abandon, but you need it next time. So all these are there at Source, Source Africa. There are so many amazing documents that you can use to investigate your stories. You know, they have data. You are able, to, for example, to get this data and include it into your stories. Eh? Uh, the last one is the tabular. Probably most of you guys have used this. This will help you extract data from PDFs. You know, more, some companies, you know, some organizations will put their data into PDF, and it may be hard for you to, you know, uh, go through and turn uh, um, turn this data into uh, usable data. For example, you want to convert it into Excel to look at, you know, uh, patterns in it. If you want, for example, you want to do a map. Of, or using this data and it is in PDF, it may be hard for you to go ahead and you know, look at patterns. But if you went to Tabula, you, you would be able to uh, extract this data and uh, be able to read it. Yeah. So um, uh, this, is, uh, I have, this is all I have for you guys. Uh, but you can always find a lot of stuff at uh, infonight.org and uh, you can uh, check us uh, on our Twitter, infonight. Info now that's the info that's the spelling of info now. Info and then now is big in capital letters. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, uh, Frederick. I am just thinking the the question that a lot of people will be asking at this point is, uh, do I have to, you know, wait until I've acquired all these skills before I can start doing the kind of journalism you guys are doing? Or is there an easier way to, to navigate your way into uh, becoming a geojournalist, into using things like Tabula, into uh, doing, you know, using all the technologies that you're using? Uh, what is the shortcut, yeah. if there is one? Yeah, yeah. Now, what we do at Infonite, uh, by the way, Infona is just a project, and I, I work with Vision Group as a news editor. So, guys, you you may not think that uh, this is a big thing, and you don't you don't you are not able to join. But we encourage journalists. I yeah, I, I yeah, I can hear you. Hello. Hello. I, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can Hello, hear ben. you. Yeah, yeah. So probably Ben can hear me. But I was telling you that Infonet is just a network of journalists. So you can be able to join. You are free to join us. If you went to Infonet site or Water Journalist Africa site, you'll be able to find a link where you can register and be part of us. When we get grants and we're giving them to journalists, we consider our network members. And uh, so when, I, like I told you, that's why I gave you a background. When, when we, 
when we get you as our grant, if we first train you, there are so many, more than 10 guys in, in here attending this that we have trained in geojournalism and they are able to use this. Uh, I, I know, Ro, Ro, for example, Ronald Musoke and uh, Rich, Richard Razumaku, uh, you guys can be their weakness. I mean, uh, we have done this with you, these guys and now they are, they are good at data journalism, much more than uh, 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 several journalists in Uganda. So yes, we can do it, you can do it. It's not hard stuff. After you have gotten the skills that Esther gave you, which is, it is important that you join, you go to geojournalism. And if, for example, if you join our network, I'll be able to train you. Thank you so much. I think Benon is frozen. Yeah, probably we can take questions if there are questions uh, coming in. Yeah, so there were, there were some questions in the Q&A mm. and... Uh... Yeah, I can see Irene Abaro Otto asking how can geojournalism work for print journalists? Yeah, so um, Irene, it, it is actually simple. I mean, geojournalism, like I told you, if you got the uh, satellite imagery, you'll be able to publish it uh, onto your page offline. If you, if you, if for example, you did data uh, visualizations, you'll be able to publish this. If you use the drone to tell what has happened, you'll be able to do this, to show it. I mean, you can show it as a, as, as a, as a photo in your, in your story online. Yeah. So it does not mean that geojournalism is meant for online guys. If it can even be done by TV, you know we have done this for TV guys who are part of members of our network. You give them skills, they do they visualize data, and they are able to embed it to in their videos. I mean, they are able to use, for example, drone images in their videos, and they come out perfectly well. Um, uh, to add to what uh, Frederick has just said. Uh, uh, our one of the best uh, environment reporters is on the call here, Tenua. Maybe he can also give us an insight on on, on that and uh, tell us more about uh, geojournalism. Okay, looks like we don't have time. Yeah. Okay, yeah, but I probably think um, now Kyundu could say one or two words or something as we get more questions. Hello, Kyundu, are you able to hear hello, us? Hello. Hmm. Yes, I can hear you. And I'm sorry, uh, since Benon has uh, dropped off. And, uh, and I don't know if you had asked all the questions on the Q&A. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much yeah I, see someone, I see someone yes. asking, how can I join the discussion? I don't know, maybe this discussion or I don't know which discussion. Mm. That is Gerald. He wanted to, I think, uh, ah, okay. supplement on your question. I think, ah, okay. Gerald, you just unmute yourself and mm. speak. Yeah, Stefano, is, are the participants able to unmute themselves? Okay, okay, let me try to unmute uh, Gerard. Hello, can uh, you welcome, hear me? Wel welcome back. Yeah, sorry. I, uh, hello. Can hello. you hear me? Yes. Looking for Gerard. Uh, do I find him? Mm -hmm. Are you able to unmute uh, Tenua? Uh, 
or Gerard, you, you can go ahead and, and talk. I see you are on mute. Hello, Gerard, can you hear me? Benon. Hey, Benon. We, we can hear you. Can yeah, I can hear you. Yes, uh, I'm asking Gerard to go ahead and say he was he wanted to talk. I think he's on mute, uh, but seems he can't hear me. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, it's unfortunate uh, we have these technical hitches. Uh, for me, is uh, just to thank you before I ask uh, Benon. Uh, to take over. Uh, my name is uh, Kiondo Wawero. Uh, I run this uh, East African EJN uh, project uh, based here in Nairobi. And, and now we have Benon who just joined us. Uh, he'll be uh, helping us with these investigative webinars and also in mentoring the journalists that we currently judging for the investigative stipends uh, that Benon and uh, James have mentioned. Uh, I'm super happy uh, to make you acquaintance. Uh, Esther and Didi, I'm sure we'll be talking more after this. Uh, Frederick, again, as uh, James said, we work together uh, on the project they're doing with WJA, uh, which we are very proud of, and uh, with uh, his partner, Anika, who is also uh, seen her on this call. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for this webinar. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know where Ben on at, at what point uh, you are, uh, but uh, I'll give it back to you. Ben on, take us home. Okay, yes. Okay. Um, I think unfortunately I lost the connection and then lost the questions as well. Um, so if uh, I'll ask Esther to share, to ask some of the questions if she can uh, very quickly and then we can wind up. Because okay, I so you, you're able to see the questions, right? Yes, and pretty much most of the questions have been asked, uh, have been answered on the chat. I don't know, um, Didi, do you want to take on any questions uh, online? And, and speak or you okay with what you have done on the chat? Um, I think I've pretty much answered all the questions addressed. Uh, perhaps I remember one which I, which I can share. Uh, there was a question for Didi that, uh, how do you navigate your way around a situation where uh, law enforcers are in cohort with, uh, with the people who are supposed, I mean, those who are doing the poaching, those who are involved in committing these crimes, how do you navigate your way around that? Um, and I think I responded and I'm seeing a follow up. Uh, so what I said is that, uh, first of all, you need to do your background as Esther and Frederick were saying, you need to do your background research, find out who are these criminal entities involved in this uh, particular trafficking syndicate that you are investigating. Uh, find out if there are any corrupt dealings, any law enforcers or law enforcement agencies involved. And paramount is that you are safe. Your safety comes first, even though it is important to get this information out to the public, your safety comes first. So once you find out this information, then you'll be able to navigate your way around. Uh, I said also, when you go to the field, you can inform the local police of your presence there. There's a follow-up question there that uh, you don't want to reveal your identity. So even uh, law enforcers, investigators do report their presence. Uh, if, for example, if you are a wildlife crime investigator from, the, from UWA, you have to report to the police of your presence in a particular area. Uh, the reason is that the criminal entities would call the, the police and report that they, they are under attack from a criminal gang, you being the criminal gang and the police, they, then come after you to rescue these criminals, not knowing that actually these criminals are lying. So it is, that is why it is important for the local police to be informed of your presence. You don't have to tell them that you're an investigative journalist doing a story, story X and Y and Z. You can just say you're a journalist from this media house and you're doing uh, some stories in the field in that area. You don't have to disclose which particular story. But if they're aware of your presence, in case they're unscrupulous criminals, 
decide to report you so that the police can come and arrest you or attack you or divert your attention, the police will be aware that you're in the area doing a story. And so you will not fall into those kind of problems. Uh, it's the same strategy used by uh, undercover wildlife crime investigators. I think it can work for journalists as well. I'm not sure, maybe Esther and Frederick can give insights from their experiences. Yeah, Esther, go ahead. Um, I, I think pretty much uh, what you have said, Didi, is true. Uh, you, you, you want to have the background information first and you do not want to, you really want to keep us, you, you really want to keep us uh, 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 your safety first before you, you, you go into uh, spilling the beans and being targeted. Um, sorry, what was, what, what was the question again? I was reading questions. Uh, the question was how, how you can keep yourself safe as a journalist and uh, safe from being targeted by law enforcers who are also involved in the crime and also by the criminal entities who may be aware that you're investigating them. Um, uh, I, I will still emphasize that uh, we have journalists on the call. I don't know if we can unmute them and they give us their experiences too. But like I said, you have to have backup as a journalist. You have to keep in touch with your media house and try as much as possible to show where you're at at every minute of the time so that if you're in there and you're investigating and something happens to you, somebody is out to rescue you. And if they're security agencies and they are out to, to uh, take you on, I think your media house has a duty to protect you and most of the time they will uh, help you out. Um, there was also an issue in, 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 in terms of, of security for you as a journalist, whether you want to put your byline on the story, we're all, all known. And it came up in one of the webinars that I attended, especially in investigative journalism and, and some people were comfortable putting their bylines on it so that if something consequently happens to you and the security agencies are coming after you, then they know that it's because of this story that you published, they, uh, you know, this is happening to you. But other people felt differently, like you don't have to put your byline, you can keep it anonymous. That's a debate for another day. But uh, I think that uh, safety in terms of you as a journalist try as much as possible to let another person know about your dealings, about what you're doing, put in as much collaboration as possible and partner with many people so that, you know, the story is wider and uh, you, you keep safe. Over yeah, to Esther. you, uh, Frederick. Yeah, Esther, I, 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 you reminded me about uh, a guy called Anas, uh, uh, that investigative journalist in uh, um, Frederick, can, can I ask yeah. you one final question as we wind up? Yeah, um, yeah go ahead. There is a question go from ahead. Godfrey Kajumba. He says, yeah. how can wildlife crime reporting be made more attractive and interesting to journalists, newsroom managers, and the public? Now, you've done sort of, you've used all kinds of tools, uh, but beyond that, uh, how can you make those stories much more attractive? Yeah, so we we will need to first find out why they are not interesting, why they are not attractive. And um, I'll give you an example. We did, uh, we are going to implement a project and we did a baseline study of you know, how journalists in the Nile Basin are reporting these issues, you know, climate change and you know, environment, water resources. And then so we were able to find out that, uh, yeah, so uh, these stories are not interesting because uh, journalists do not make them simple. And then readers, you know, kind of fear them. They, they think they're hard. Again, we will we learn of a big trust gap between journalists and researchers. And so uh, we, we are actually working on a platform that is being used to put together. But again, um, what I told you uh, actually is uh, it, it comes out of the research that we did and then this is a solution that we are, we are doing. 
to make these uh, studies interesting, you must go ahead and use different uh, approaches. Like I told you, the approach of satellite imagery, the approach of drone, and you know, the, you, you start looking at these studies from another angle. I, I also do not agree with the journalists who may think that investigations means that you have to, you know, go ahead and you know, fight, fight. Uh, I mean, as in you have to write these hard stories, you know, you have to write, you have to use different means to get this info. You can use, you can investigate, for example, using a satellite image and you show it to us. It does not mean that you are not investigating. We probably need to uh, define I mean, the, the, the term investigation and uh, you know, bring it to a, a simpler term. But uh, again, I think, uh, uh, Geoffrey, you can go ahead and uh, use all these techniques. Uh, for example, if you're doing, if you're working with, uh, um, if you're working with print, you can think of, you know, uh, venturing into uh, short videos that are so attractive. They, they are short videos, one or two minutes that you can do uh, for your story. If you go out and do investigations, you can go with your camera and do investigate and, and you know, come and uh, show this video to us. And then these, you know, the, for example, these short videos will attract uh, the youth and the youth now will be your audience. Again, you can think of doing blogs as in your know, blogs. You can think of doing um, uh, uh, podcasts and then you are able to do different podcasts. It does not mean that when you do a podcast and you put on all these facts, you are not doing investigations. So there are so many. You can talk about this data as you know, uh, you work on this thing. Okay, thank you, Frederick. I think what you have talked about uh, sort of really hits uh, the point home as to what the intention of this webinar was, uh, which was we were trying to say under the current restrictions that uh, we face in Uganda and that we face general around the world, where we can't move as much as we used to do. We can't visit some of the parks, some of the, uh, the sites that we used to, to visit to do these kinds of investigations. How can we adapt to this situation by using much more innovative uh, ways of doing it? And I think what you just shared with us uh, drives the point home. So um, I think we'll have to stop at this point. We're almost reaching the two hour mark. Uh, I apologize for the, the glitches, the, the technical glitches that uh, made it difficult to have some of the members of the audience speak to us. Uh, but we, we are really happy that you, one, stuck through with us up to the end of the webinar, and two, you asked a number of questions. Uh, I saw the Q&A box was really busy. Uh, you asked a lot of questions, and uh, thank you to the panel that answered those questions both uh, by text and also just speaking about them live. So um, thank you so much, Didi Wamukoya. Uh, thank you so much, Esther Nakazi, and thank you so much, Frederick Mujira. Uh, this has been a really insightful conversation. We'll be sharing the, the slides with everybody such that you can continue to have a look at uh, the tools and tips that were shared and also the contacts of the people who have spoken to you. Um, thank you, everybody, for being part of this webinar. Uh, see you next time when we are able to organize something similar. For now, bye-bye. Bye-bye.